since I'm the local, the local speaker. I hope you're enjoying the weather, although I think all over the country it's been so unseasonably warm that people aren't super excited like they usually are to get down to Miami earlier than usual. But we're excited to have you all here in our wonderful city. I am thrilled and really honored and humbled to have been asked to give this talk to all of you because I am among distinguished leaders, people who have served as chairman and certainly have had roles that are far beyond where I am right now, but I certainly aspire to be one day. And it's a, pri it's a privilege, really, to talk about a topic that's really near and dear to my heart and a lot of what I have conversations about daily with our students, trainees, my faculty, and everyone of the sort. When I was first asked to give this presentation, I thought, I'm going to be at the same speaking venue as Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen and Gloria Steinem, and how could I possibly have insights to share with all of you with these distinguished thought leaders? So I was hypothesizing that you know, even in my mid-career, maybe I'm a little too junior to share these really thoughtful insights. And it took my 12-year-old daughter all of maybe 20 seconds to bring me down from cloud nine when about a month ago, Gabby and I were having a conversation at dinner about Women's History Month. And she was sharing something she was learning in school. And she stopped short. And randomly, she turns to me and says, Mom, were you born when women had the right to vote? And I thought. <laughs> I said, you know, I know she's a tween and she's more interested in texting and her hair and I'd like to know that she's a good student, but, you know, I, she doesn't spend a lot of time getting her dates right regarding women's suffrage. And I wasn't really sure how to respond at the time, so of course I went over when the 19th Amendment was passed and she really didn't care. She just made her point, which was, to her I'm old and maybe ancient, and so maybe even in a, in a mid-career I certainly have lived through a variety of transitions since the time I decided to become a doctor and where I am now. So with that, I am thrilled to share with you my thoughts and comments about women in medicine beyond the glass ceiling. And coincidentally, and this really did happen today, I came to all of you from my nine-year-old daughter's pioneer day at school. And uh, the nine-year-old girls got to square dance with the nine-year-old boys, and they survived the sweaty hands and all the grossness of promenading. But then after the square dance, they came back to their classes and they shared all their historical perspectives that they learned about our pioneers, such as Amelia Earhart and Helen Keller and Sacagawea and all the women that we know in our American history. And I had planned and thought that it was fitting that I too would be talking about the beginning of this talk and my comments with uh, the women that are our pioneers in medicine. And I've got to be honest, I didn't know all the pictures when I was looking them all up. So some of you would probably recognize uh, Amelia, not Amelia Earhart, where's my, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm looking for my pointer. Pointer on here is just the button, sorry, on the bottom. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, I'll use this one. That's easy. Perfect, thank you. Can you just get that off? Yeah, I'll take that off. Thank you. So, Virginia Apgar and Elizabeth Blackwell and Gertie Corey, who was our first woman in America to win the Nobel Prize in Medicine, and then a woman whose picture I didn't know but name I knew, Bertha Van Hoosen, who is the founder and first president of AMWA. So these pioneers led the way for so much that we will be reflecting on today. And in this talk, I do plan to spend some time describing the glass ceiling phenomenon because I think the historical perspective is really interesting, as well as the historical progress of women in medicine. And I hope by the end of our time together, I'm able to answer for you or have you reflect on whether you feel we truly are beyond the glass ceiling. So before we can answer that, we've got to think about whether everybody understands what the glass ceiling is and a little, a little historical perspective on where the phenomenon started. The term glass ceiling came about sometime in the 70s, and although the original origins, whether it is attributed to some authors and some writers, there's some debate over that. But ultimately, when it was used, it was used to describe that there was really no visible barrier to the advancement of women in executive positions. And in reality, what was happening was women hit a level above which they seemed unable to rise. And although we don't know exactly where the glass ceiling came about in terms of how it was first used, again, some debate between some of the authors, the term resonated with women, mostly in, all, in business, but all over mostly America, where it came to be, because women noticed that there was this invisible barrier, the glass, and this metaphor has come to really mean that women can see the elite positions, but they just can't reach them. 
therefore the ceiling. So despite entry by women into any field traditionally occupied mainly by men, the, ver the barriers that exist we know prevent a large number of women and also ethnic minorities from ever entering these really prestigious, powerful, and sometimes the highest grossing positions across disciplines in the workforce. Back in 1995, the US Department of Labor had established the Federal Glass Ceiling Commission. This was part of the Civil Rights Act of 1991. And this group was mandated to actually identify the barriers. What were these barriers that were preventing the advancement of women into the labor force? And they identified two major societal barriers that both cause and reinforce the glass ceiling. We had the supply barrier, which we'll draw some parallels from in a little bit. This was just related to opportunity and achievement. And then the significance, I'm sorry, excuse me, the, the difference barrier. And this manifests itself as conscious and unconscious stereotypes, prejudices, and biases related both to gender and ethnicity. The barriers were there, they were known, and we knew that they were precluding the elimination of the glass ceiling. And I feel that we can draw many, many, many parallels between the historical context of the glass ceiling and all those barriers, and still what we see and face in our environments today. I'm gonna to discuss some of these similarities where we see that the barriers at the time that were noted and studied included lack of vigorous and consistent monitoring and enforcement, a weakness in the collection of employment-related data. We needed data to be able to prove things, inadequate reporting and dissemination of information relative to glass ceiling issues, other barriers, different pay for comparable work, sexual, ethnic, racial, and religious discrimination, or harassment in the workplace, lack of family-friendly workplace policies, exclusion from all the informal networks that were helpful for success, stereotypes, preconceptions of women's roles and abilities, failure of senior leadership to assume accountability for women's advancement, lack of role models, and lack of mentoring. And if that's not exhausting, then I don't know what is. All of this, though, sadly, I think, is quite familiar to many of us in the room when we talk about our work environment in medicine. And certainly, we know that they may have changed over time. When I was looking back at the historical context of the glass ceiling, I came across another metaphor called the glass labyrinth that was brought about by Eagley and Carly, some psychologists also in the late 70s. And I thought that this was a really interesting description that's a little bit different and not necessarily unique to women, but certainly describes how we go about manipulating our way through the maze. And the term glass labyrinth is interesting because it conveys a more complex path, that the journey towards a goal worth striving for is not necessarily a straight road. When we pass through a labyrinth, it's not simple, and it's certainly not direct, and it requires persistence and every step of the way, careful analysis of the puzzle that lies ahead and which way we're gonna turn. But the obstacles that you face in a labyrinth in the workplace would be similar to that if we're going in a straight trajectory. Prejudice, resistance to leadership, leadership style issues, and family demands. Really, no different, but just a more circuitous route, if you will. And then in the 90s, we, we came about with the pipeline theory. And we talk about this a lot, specifically regarding matriculation and what happens when women become medical students and what happens to our field of physicians along the way. And I'll keep reflecting on, on the pipeline for a little bit as we talk about getting to that glass ceiling. The theory of the pipeline really describes what's pretty obvious in this photograph. Women are placed on a track that would eventually promote them to top positions, just like men and really just like anybody else in the workforce. The process is long. It might take 20, 30 years to get there, and people are in the pipeline waiting to advance. But even though women in the pipeline are sufficiently trained and certainly capable and eligible to compete for top-level positions, they're held back from advancement, and we don't always understand why. So when we talk about the glass ceiling or the glass labyrinth and the pipeline theory, in medicine, is it that we're facing an issue of supply? Is there not enough water to supply the pipeline? Or are there other factors that are causing the leaks or blockages? We know that there are some factors that seem not unique to women, but more importantly, impactful to women, and that women make sacrifices and trade-offs significantly while moving up the pipeline. Do our work environments support and sustain women in medicine? 
And do the women have the desire to keep going and make it through the pipeline so they can fill the higher leadership positions? I hope that we address these questions throughout our remainder of our time together. And I also would hope that at this point, you're already thinking, yes, of course we do. So where, where are the issues? Why is it that we're still talking about a glass ceiling? We know we've made substantial progress in medicine, certainly since the time of our pioneers. And I know that we still have a way to go. So let's look at supply. This graph comes from the AAMC database. And it's easy to see, if you compare the last 10 years, that we really don't have an issue with matriculation. If anything, that's certainly something to applaud. Here we are in 2010, 2011, and out of about 19,000 medical school matriculants, almost half are women. We're right at the 50% mark, which is something to applaud all of you who are students in the room. It's a wonderful accomplishment. And since most of that useful data comes from the AAMC, and I encourage all of you, if you're ever going through a negotiation and need to get data on the status of women in medicine and in leadership, go to the Association of American Medical Colleges website. There's a lot of great reports that come from there. And this snapshot, which comes usually annually, uh, looking at women in different ranks in academic medicine, even though 35% of women, fac are, women are faculty, excuse me, 35% of all faculty in academic medical centers are women, what's happened in the past 10 years is still fairly striking, particularly at the higher levels. So if this reflects enough in the back, the percent change at the highest level in the decanal positions is 117%. And looking at that, we might say, wow, that is absolutely incredible. But only 13% of all medical school deans are women. And similarly, 13% of our department chairs nationwide are women. And only 19% are full professors. So we've made a lot of progress. There's been a huge change. And that's attributed to many of the things I'm going to talk about that are still happening today that have led the way. But we're certainly not quite there yet. Another graphic representation of that same data is a little bit more striking here. I think if you compare faculty by rank and gender, you see women in green, the men in purple. And follow as you go up the academic rank from instructor to assistant professor, still making up 50% of the pool, to associate professor to full professor for women compared to the men where as we go up we still see a fairly large proportion of the pie of men who are full professors. In medicine, the term glass ceiling was first used in reference to the status of women in academic medicine by Nickerson and colleagues in 1990 in a JAMA article. And in that study, the promotion rates for women and men in Columbia were being evaluated. And it was the first time that the, the use of glass ceiling was applied to the academic medicine environment. Similarly, back in the 90s, Drs. Nattinger and Tesh at the Medical College of Wisconsin here surveyed men and women physicians who joined the faculty at the same time. And they found that fewer women were promoted and that women had also been given far less institutional support at the early stages of their career. So they created an additional metaphor that's been used widely now in books and in the business world I've seen often, which is called the sticky floor. And the sticky floor reflects to whatever those factors are that seem to adhere to women's feet, keeping them stuck to the floor, even if they're trying to get up to the glass ceiling. So why is it? Why is it OK that we are having these conversations about difficulties in women's advancement? We know that half of our med school population now are women, and we want to be able to eliminate those obstacles. What are the barriers that women face today? Are they the same in our medical schools, in our teaching hospitals, and in practices? And how do they affect women's ability to create a successful and satisfying career? Many of these that I mentioned when the Glass Ceiling Commission came about in the early 90s to review the workplace in general, in business, or in, in just in industry really apply to medicine in the same way. We know that women cite a lack of understanding of their professional environment. They also don't know quite how to navigate it. There are too few resources in place to assist in development, few leadership expectations. Why is it that less is expected of us from the get-go? There are always family and child care issues, few senior role models, and then a belief that gender is an obstacle to career. Women have less self-worth than men, and then they feel isolated as a result, and there's always the lack of mentoring. But not all is gloomy. There are a lot of strides that we've made. And as we talk about the advances we've made, I want to hone in on a few key individuals that I've looked to over the years 
whom I think have really changed the culture of medicine for all of us, both in academics and in practice. I don't think Janet Bickel is here, but many of you probably know her. Janet Bickel is one of those pioneers, I think, of the movement to advance leadership of women in medicine. And as an amazing person she is, when I met her, I was introduced to her by my then medical education dean when I was a sophomore medical student and I was in the AAMC as one of the organization of student representatives. And my deputy dean for medical education, who was also a well-known faculty, uh, women faculty advocate and quite politically active, Dr. Janet Canterbury, came over and said, Halit, let me introduce you to my friend Janet. So Janet introduced me to Janet, and I, I actually thought Janet Bickle was a physician. I had no idea who she was. I thought she's one of these important people I'm meeting at the meeting. And little did I know that she was really beginning to transform the climate for women uh, across the country. And it's been a pleasure to stay in touch with her and look to her for advice with some of the work that I've done and send things off to her to review. She's just the most gracious and incredible leader. She, uh, she was brought in to the AAMC through a long, long trajectory of a, a wonderful career at Brown's medical science program before it became a medical school. But really what was monumental in 1987 when the AAMC created its first Office of Women in Medicine, Janet was asked to lead at the helm and spent 13 years of her time there, really breaking ground with her leadership. I look at what she did early on. She was the one who first published national studies on faculty maternity leave policies, maternity leave policies for residents, parental leave policies for, for all faculty, and then pro promotion and personnel policies also for part-time faculty. And this was at a time where nobody was having the dialogue about things that were important to medicine. And so how did she accomplish so much? And I look to her and share her success as a, an example of the combination of both a commitment to women and a commitment and vision which have continuously transformed our culture in medicine. One of the things that Janet did most was increase transparency. Data spoke to medical school deans, especially in the academic world. Data was important, and we had to have research, and, and evidence-based medicine was coming into play. And at the time, data didn't exist. And thanks to these benchmark studies that were created at the time that Janet led the Office of Women in Medicine, all of a sudden, deans had to pay attention to the fact that the numbers reflecting their institutions, how many women were on the faculty, what ranks those women were at, became public. And that mattered. That mattered because it was public information and it was a report card of sorts of how things were going across the country. She connected women in medicine throughout the country, brought societies together, and really also uh, created landmark faculty development programs that exist to this day that so many women are benefiting from at, uh, at the WMC through the Group on Women in Medicine. And if that wasn't enough of a legacy, she also authored back in 2002 really what was a landmark paper called Increasing Women's Leadership in Academic Medicine. This was the first report to articulate a systems view of the challenge before us. At that time, the committee that, that was implementing these, these remarks were really addressing accelerating institutional and societal needs and commenting on the fact that the waste of women's potential is, is and was of growing importance. They recognized early on that only the institutions able to recruit and retain women would likely be able to maintain the best house staff and faculty. And they viewed that the long-term success of our academic health centers were inextricably linked to the development of women leaders. Now this paper came out 10 years ago, and it's inspiring and important for us to reflect on all the work completed by leaders over medicine, really over the past two or three decades, efforts that have brought all of these issues into the limelight. And they fostered the development of policies, programs, and in some instances, thankfully, a cultural overhaul of environments in medicine. So as we strive to think about how far we've come and what the challenges were that were faced, I just highlight back in 2002 what the focus was of this landmark report and who's, who's taking all of this forward and moving ahead with the agenda that was set. In this particular position paper, the committee that was headed by Janet Bickle recommended at the time that all medical schools, teaching hospitals, and academic societies emphasize faculty diversity target women's professional needs. They seem really basic at this point when we talk about them. Assess which institutional practices tend to favor men's over women's professional development. Enhance the effectiveness of search committees so we recruit women. Financially support institutional women in medicine programs and then make sure that women are getting promoted to senior ranks. 
these tenets really seem obvious. It almost seems silly to say, say these things to the group of women that are before us here as part of AMWA, where we say, well, of course that was important. But I remind you, this was only a decade ago that it required this kind of effort to make an impact on the culture of medicine that we were all facing. And without these early efforts, really, we would still be quite a far cry from the culture that now supports the success of women. So in the last decade, what's been going on? And I want to make sure that everybody knows about another amazing body of work that was, rep that was uh, recognized not too long ago by the AAMC, and that is the Sea Change Initiative. Many physicians, after Janet's remarkable work and since that time and, and currently also, are all engaged in national efforts to study the climate of women in medicine. Everybody continues to try to answer the question of why. Why are we still struggling to achieve gender parity? The work here being done by Dr. Linda Pololi, who's at Brandeis, and her team of researchers, they're leading what is called the National Initiative on Gender, Culture, and Leadership in Medicine. For short, C change, C meaning culture change. And this project engages medical schools in action research with Brandeis University in order to facilitate a culture change, mostly so that all faculty members can contribute fully. And I really see that the effects of the work that this group is doing spears not only in academic health centers, but really across the country for all women and all uh, even ethnic minorities in medicine. The research that they've been working on has informed our national community on many of the reasons why we still face barriers. The studies that they're conducting have identified a continued lack of alignment between faculty and institutions the existence of a hierarchy, gender differences, biases, to name a few. But what the team has done most, most importantly is engage leaders, some outside of medicine, to help advocate for findings of a solution. The Sea Change Initiative is, yes, providing us with data, but in addition to that, creating solutions and creating change that we all are benefiting from and will continue to benefit from. So I believe that Dr. Pololi and her team are also pioneers. People are engaged, they're aware, others have paved the way for a better understanding of our culture and what's happening for women in medicine. And we value everything that women physicians bring to the workplace. So when I think about why is it that women physicians are still not satisfied, I have to be careful how I ask that question. I say women physicians and not women in general, and it depends on the audience you ask, because some will believe that women will never be satisfied, and that's part of what makes us great. We always want more, and we should never be satisfied or we'll never continue to strive for more. But researchers are still trying to answer this question. Even, even last year, this year, the studies continue. So I point out this particular study, again, not to talk only about academic medicine, but a dear friend of mine and a colleague working on a lot of part-time work uh, with me is Rachel Levine, and her colleagues at Johns Hopkins University actually sought to better identify what was creating part of that leaky pipeline. Women enter academic medicine at a higher rate than men do, but they leave faster than men. And if we don't fix the pipeline, the women come in and something's making them leave, and we have the numbers and we have the data, but I don't know how many of you are in, at institutions that do not conduct exit interviews. If you don't ask the women why they're leaving, mine included, thank you, if you don't ask women why they're leaving, then we really can't begin to understand what the issues are today in 2012. So this excellent study did just that and did a qualitative review of about 20 women that had left the institution. And it was no surprise, the women that were interviewed concluded that there was still a discrepancy between their own and the institutional priorities. And these were women that left about four years into academic practice, pretty early in their careers. They each claimed that they differed in how each measured success, the woman faculty and the institution. And therefore, the women felt devalued at work. They felt they couldn't succeed by the own standards that the institution put before them. So it was no surprise that they didn't stay put. Another modern day pioneer whom I admire for her continued efforts to share her insights and study of factors affecting women in medicine today is Dr. Molly Carnes. I don't know if Molly's here. Is Dr. Carnes here? No, she's not here. Okay, I didn't know if she was coming. In addition to her outstanding clinical work and leadership, she really has devoted a significant portion of her academic career also to the study of advancement of women in medicine. And just recently, I don't know if any of you saw this, she penned a wonderful piece of my mind in JAMA, and it was entitled, What Would Patsy Mink Think? She offers some wonderful lessons regarding the progress that we have made and the barriers that still exist. So another quick history lesson for those that don't know, Patsy Mink was the first woman of color to serve in the US Congress. 
Originally, she wanted to become a physician, and she applied to 20 medical schools and was not accepted at a single one back then because none accepted women. And I know most of you who are students here would look around and say, how is that possible? I can't imagine that we would be facing discrimination just based on gender alone. It seems like it was eons ago, and it really was not that long ago. She attended law school instead, got herself elected to Congress, and went on to do amazing things, one of which was authoring Title IX. And this was one of the 1972 education amendments that was part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title IX is also called the Patsy Mink Amendment. And this prevents now institutions of higher education from discriminating against women in admissions. Dr. Carnes writes this piece commenting that she entered medical school two years, only two years, after Title IX was authored. She shares anecdotes that I really would venture to say would make most freshman medical student women cringe, laugh, think, think the comments are absurd. For example, Dr. Carnes writes that an interviewer for medical school asked her, quote, how do you think you're going to be a doctor if you have children? Now that question's really illegal. So, I, you know, I, I read this and say, really? Someone could ask that. Dr. Carnes was told by her junior surgery clerkship director, quote, I promise it won't affect your grade, but I want you to know that I don't think women should be doctors. Now, mind you, this is not a surgeon saying you really shouldn't be a surgeon. He's saying, you shouldn't be a doctor. If one of my students in my Dean of Student Services office came in and told me this comment, they'd probably be in tears and ask me, where could I report that faculty member's unprofessional behavior? That's how far we've come. But this was not that long ago that these were the comments that she received. She was told women don't have what it takes to be researchers, and another faculty told her she was too nice to go into academic medicine. Imagine if she listened to that advice. And that came from a psychiatrist. So, so uh, no offense to our psychiatrist. Dr. Carnes, though, appropriately reflects in the end of her piece that Patsy Mink would be very pleased if she saw the climate today. She would be very pleased to see that 50% of our entering medical classes are women and that we are increasingly visible and effective in top leadership positions in all areas of medicine. Women physicians continue to make ex exceptional contributions in education, research, patient care, and practice. And much of that explicit prejudice that was rampant only 40 years ago has really nearly been eliminated. But as you've heard in some of the themes today in the other talks, we're not quite there yet. It's important to celebrate our advances and our gains in gender equity since the passage of Title IX. But Dr. Carnes concludes that we really would have to admit to Patsy Mink that the promise of Title IX for complete gender equity still remains fulfilled. What, what's one of the main issues that's still out there? And I would suggest that it's still that there is a significant gender gap in salary. You may be familiar with this recent study that was published in Health Affairs last year. Losasso and colleagues here note that there was a huge disparity that gave us sobering news regarding the widening gender gap in salary inequity in practice. And their study looked at male physicians and female physicians, the women that were graduating fresh from residency training in the state of New York in 2008. And they found that there was almost a $17,000 difference, more obviously for the men in their starting salaries than the women counterparts. This was after controlling for all variables, including medical specialty, patient care hours, practice type, location, physician age, experience, rank within an institution, and on-the-job productivity. Astounding, $17,000, probably because of gender alone. The last time published data like this came out in 1999, the difference was about $3,600. So we could argue inflation and things like that, but that doesn't account for all of it. The most interesting thing was the commentary that came after this. The team behind the study was very reluctant to cite a rise in any gender discrimination as a contributing factor. Instead, they hypothesized that women physicians might be settling for lower compensation. Why? In exchange for the more flexible, family-friendly working conditions. Well, I applaud the leaders of AMWA because a lot of press was given to this study back then. And some of your leaders who were part of the Gender Equity Task Force and interviewed when these results came out stated, absolutely not, that gender bias is the likely reason that women physicians are paid less. At the time that the results were released and the task force was, was part of the, uh, the discussion, it just seemed like it was clear to those who participate in academic, uh, excuse me, in, in medicine who are women that organizations continue to tout their ability to get women for less. We don't know why, we can't always explain why. 
Even if employers offer flexible, family-friendly working arrangements to women physicians, we know that women physicians tend to give away more just because. We give up more because we think we should. And if women physicians try to negotiate higher salaries on their own, they're viewed often in the, in the industries by gender stereotypes that lead employers to view them as being too demanding. So some shy away from it. In addition, challenges that we face have a lot to do with societal stereotypes and these implicit gender biases. We, the women, are required to make many more gender-related adaptations than men in order to succeed. And sometimes we do this willingly. We do it unknowingly. I shouldn't say willingly. We do it unknowingly because it's expected of us and we view having to make sacrifices as part of our need to succeed. Especially in healthcare, what we see a lot is that we are expected to be nurturing and collaborative in ways that men are not. You know all the studies out there that show why women make such great physicians. There's a reason that 50% of our incoming classes are women and why I know as a faculty member that when I have students I'm teaching interviewing to, it's no surprise that I have such joy working with the women who seem like naturally born communicators. We do a wonderful job, but we give up a lot in the process, somehow getting acculturated to a system that doesn't support growth that should be equal between men and women in our environment. We see that women continue to underestimate their own abilities and limit their goals. But we continue to outnumber men in the universities. And the young women who are going to follow in our footsteps all really expect equity as a right. Some of these things that we discuss would, would strike a younger woman as asinine. And, and they might really say, how could that be? And so we don't want this to be viewed as entitlement, but a true issue that we, more senior or more mid-career, really need to continue to role model how women will continue to make their mark on our culture of medicine. It's our role to prepare our future generation and future leaders for the challenges that they really might not know they still are going to face. So I would be remiss if I didn't spend some time talking about what I really do believe is the most pervasive issue facing women in the challenge of work-life balance. I do believe that this particular issue has really dominated the medical workforce arena, more specifically but not exclusively for women. And I really am proud to share in all of the successes that we've made as a medical community. And I know and, and continue to be optimistic that collectively we can and will continue to make a career in medicine regardless of specialty, which I think I say daily in my office to all of my medical students, some of whom are here, rewarding both at home and at work. Whether women or men are seeking more time, flex time, time to care for a parent, taking personal time for renewal and personal wellness, or just cutting back near retirement, Leaders in medicine at all our institutions and in practice really must recognize that more balance has been proven with data to show an increase in physician satisfaction, decrease in burnout, improvement in personal alignment with organizational values, and ultimately better patient care and better outcomes. Supporting women's needs to have control over work and home is the right thing to do. Policies were written at some institutions over 20 years ago. Many of those places are the models that work. In other instances, policies are written and shoved aside, never implemented. And yet at some institutions, the policies are yet to be written, sadly. Where we can continue to be a strength at a time where this is paramount is in supporting each other and follow and supporting those who will follow behind us in careers in medicine, recognizing that we can't become complacent with this issue. It really will be dangerous if we start now thinking that just because supportive, part-time, flexible policies exist that we've done our job. Because the women that follow behind us, and the men too, who are seeking more balance in their lives and should seek more balance as physicians who will be satisfied, will come to the rude awakening that without continued efforts to operationalize these policies and make a work-life balance existent in medicine, we will have a lot of, of uh, leakage across genders very soon in our own profession. I really believe that continuing to support this, this whole movement is a key in helping women and men achieve their goals beyond stereotypes and also achieve what they want as leaders, that this is the key to helping women achieve success. And I'll talk a little bit about my own experience with this, which really shaped the rest of my career. 
I also think it's important to mention that finding satisfaction and flexibility should not be equated with entitlement. There's a lot of misperception, particularly by some of our more senior and particularly male leaders who went through their training at a different time, that by wanting to achieve balance in our lives, we feel entitled. And I think that that's a significant misperception that is probably the hardest thing to express and is very challenging even in my mid-career to talk to younger trainees and students about because it seems like a right, that equity that I was talking about, that people expect it to be a certain way because they don't know any differently, which is a wonderful area of success that the perception is that it should be that way, but it doesn't always come easily, and that's why we're here to help our, our, those following behind us learn that lesson. So what happened to me? And why was I, I think, asked to give this talk to all of you? I think I lived through a time where, in some places, those institutions where policies were written 20 years ago, I was inspired by all of that. And I learned, outside of my own area of training, that it was possible to seek some more balance in my life. But I found that the time in my career that was really the most disheartening was about the fifth to seventh year of my part-time work. I was really proud of having negotiated a decreased workload at the time that I was pregnant with my first daughter and a complete change in my job description that came about simply because no one really had to pay me any differently to give me the work I wanted to do. I was teaching in a community clinic. It was a funded opportunity as part of an AHEC supported effort. And I basically could tell my division chief that I just wanted to drop the other half of my work. So to him, it was a no-brainer. He didn't have to pay me anymore, which was fine. Nobody had to support any part of this change in my job description. So it seemed like a win-win at the time, and it was really wonderful when it started. I got to teach and see patients, and I got to spend half of my time at home. Bless you. So I got to be home and, and do what I really wanted to do, and that continued for a while. But then what happened? Well, I got the itch to do more. I realized I'm not satisfied at work only doing this little piece of my job. I went into academic medicine for a reason, and I found that right around year four or five, I started wanting to get more involved in teaching and in medical education. And for me, my interest was in career advising and in student affairs. And I thought, well, I'm doing all of this informally. Why can't I win back some of that supported effort? So, I negotiated some more, and I got a little tiny piece of a pie to help with our career advising program. And what ended up happening was I revamped an entire medical school program, but from home, on my own time. And I did that for a while because I was very proud of having a challenge before me. I really, I was getting bored. I knew I was not meant to be a full-time stay-at-home mom. And many of you are in that situation because you've always been driven to achieve. So here I was working a lot more than the time I was being compensated for and proud of it for a while, but then feeling like the right thing to do was to just add back time at work. And that would have been all fine and dandy. But what started happening was each time I came to the negotiating table to ask for a little bit more, I was still negotiating for a part-time role. And with time, I continuously felt more marginalized and more... Uh, more devalued for what I was trying to do because everything I was accomplishing was being viewed from the lenses that I was this part-time monster. Nobody really knew what to do with me. And it just seemed like I should keep doing what I'm doing for far less compensation. I happened to be at a place where we didn't have a policy, so I had given up all of my benefits. And after seven years, I felt, you know, even at a half-time salary of a physician, I, I should be entitled to something um, to, to show for it. So. Obviously, I became quite disheartened. I can't describe how many nights of tears were uh, shed, despite not wanting to show them to the people I was negotiating with. So it became a challenge, and I tried, and I tried, and I found that there was just limited negotiation around productivity, measures of outcome. I was trying to show expectations that I could meet. And the bottom line was that leadership equals full-time, and flexible means nothing. So what was I to do? Well, yeah, I cried a lot. And after crying a lot, I said, I'm done crying, and, and I'm tired of this. I was also fortunate to be married to a wonderful man who's another academic general internist. And watching his career trajectory go like this while mine was like this was not that easy. So I looked to my colleagues, and I found colleagues in groups such as AMWA, I happen to be very involved with the Society of General Internal Medicine, which is my academic home, and those people there were advocating and writing about the importance of flexibility in the workplace. 
They welcomed my questions and my participation in national dialogue about this topic where I had felt so alone and so vulnerable. And here was a group of people not only willing to listen, but willing to bring me in. And I really credit my mentor, one of my mentors, but the person who I think really changed my career, who is Dr. Mark Linzer, who was the former Division Chief of General Internal Medicine at the University of Wisconsin, and now he's in Minnesota. He helped me focus my personal frustration into action. Rather than wallow in self-pity, which I did plenty of, I was encouraged to promote the value of encouraging part-time careers. And I got to embark on a really wonderful new journey, which included educating other people and other physicians and other leaders locally, regionally, nationally, about the benefits of work environments that do allow physicians to find more balance. I had found what I learned to be called a professional niche. And I found a way, in a very satisfying manner, to contribute to the professional development of my colleagues, my medical students, and it really gave me meaning, not only in my work, but in the passion that I believed so strongly about. I've learned from many colleagues throughout my journey who have had similar challenges and who've really been eager to band together to promote progress. We do have strength in numbers and power in multiple voices and multiple visions. The positive outcomes have been measurable for me, and it's really been a privilege for me to participate in this meaningful work promoting an issue that's near and dear to my heart. And I just have to give a shout out, if anybody is here from Wisconsin, I know I've mentioned lots of doctors from Wisconsin. At one point in my life, I did say to my husband, you know, let's just move to Wisconsin. They get it in Wisconsin. And he laughed and he said, your warm-blooded Miami will never survive in Wisconsin. But really, wonderful people there. And just an environment that seems to promote at all levels a belief in work-life balance. So if you want to move somewhere and you can tolerate the cold, go to Wisconsin. My experience really in being mentored, which is what this is all about, was really unique because it was across gender and across generations. And my mentor reflected on all of that from the beginning of our relationship together. It taught me the importance as well of paying it forward. I really have personally benefited from so many role models who exemplify that individual balance is possible, even if it's a struggle to manage at times. I find that I refer now to life much more as a juggle. Ball can fall at any time, but with correct positioning and planning, we can really keep the momentum going. I also have learned what it's like to be a role model for others. I find that honesty works best. We really need to always add when we share with others what we've overcome. There's nothing more meaningful to me than to have a conversation with a student or a trainee or a young faculty member who is similarly in a position with whatever they're grappling with and to realize that those of us that have achieved some success, whatever that may be and however we define it, didn't get there overnight. And it's okay for us to share in a very honest way some of the challenges that we face because it's incredibly meaningful for our students and trainees and young faculty to see that it takes effort. It takes effort to get there. You can't give up, but you have to have tools to be able to negotiate the terrain that sometimes is quite challenging. So is there a glass ceiling? Unfortunately, although we are about to celebrate 100 years since that monumental 19th Amendment and 100 years of AMWA and 40 years since Title IX's transformative legislation, the vision of equal opportunity for women and men in all aspects of medicine has not yet fully been realized. But I believe that if we continue to stand together as a group, that we all can continue to make those cracks in the metaphor, take the hammer, keep hammering away in a way that eventually will get us there. How do we continue the progress started by our pioneers? Well, in a lot of ways, and some of the things that are going to be continued to be highlighted here at the meeting. Continue to develop our women leaders through great programs that exist, through AMWA, through the AAMC. Have institutional and practice advocates. Coach young women. Help them prepare for the unexpected, things that they may feel they are uh, expecting, not necessarily entitled to, but things they view as equity and may not realize that they're going to have to work for that. Draw attention to gender bias when it exists. Build a community of colleagues, which obviously everybody here is part of, and remind women to support each other. AMWA is soon to celebrate 100 years and really should be proud of all of its successes. As an organization dedicated to the voice and vision of women in medicine, I think AMWA is achieving all of those goals that I listed two seconds ago. In 2011, AMWA was recognized as an organization by the Group on Women in Medicine and Science just last year, as well as uh, Dr. Pololi, for AMWA's efforts to transform leadership for women in medicine. 
Another way that AMWA is promoting change, AMWA is part of the national delegation being brought together to participate in Vision 2020, which is a project that is aiming to begin a national dialogue and propose an action agenda to affect positive change. And AMWA continues to recognize the successes of women and those in varied generations who will continue to lead the new graduates of our schools to follow their passions and be tomorrow's leaders. And you'll hear about all of them in greater detail and they're in your program, so congratulations to all of you. AMWA's leadership and task forces also demonstrate a commitment to promoting change by writing position papers. This is just one example of a position paper on gender equity that exists. And we heard this morning about another, or a goal to, uh, to support ideas related to hormone use. So we need the power of our voices to collectively band together to help make and promote change and keep the voices of women strong. I've mentioned a few times the group on women in medicine and science, and again, I encourage all of you to just view the resources that are available on the web and think about leadership development opportunities that are there for women across the country because they're wonderful. Similar to what's on the AMWA site, there's a lot here that everybody can benefit from. One of AMWA's own leaders, Dr. Linda Brodsky, created another resource to help promote women physicians in the healthcare workforce and update antiquated gender-based practices. On her site here, Expediting the Inevitable, she invites you to join and get involved. So together with leaders and organizations, I do believe that we can continue to create successful and satisfying careers for women and ultimately eliminate the promotion gap, lessen the retention gap, utilize specific missions for our efforts, which should include mentoring, networking, advocacy, studying what works, learning about successes, and then ultimately celebrating all of those successes. I'm gonna close in a couple minutes, and I just wanna share the two tenets. I, I'm not one who remembers quotes or jokes. I can read them and repeat them, but two weeks later I forget them. So the fact that these have stuck with me mean a lot to me. These two statements, one came from Janet Bickle at a leadership development conference, and the other from a doctor named Suzanne Fletcher, who for many years was a practicing physician at Harvard and a former, uh, former editor of Annals of Internal Medicine, and is married also to a general internist, her husband, Bob Fletcher. And she was a former president of the Society of General Internal Medicine. And in one of her presidential speeches, she was the one talking about the fact that women are most productive in their fifth decade of life. And that stuck with me because I know that for many of us that are not quite there yet, we keep feeling that pull, that tug, that, that we have to get there. We have to be as productive as we expect to be now at every given day. And that was, for me, part of what led to such a disconnect between work and life. You can't do it all. So Janet summed that up at another leadership conference where she said, women can have it all. They just can't have it all at the same time. And you've probably all heard that. And I think I think about that at least every other week. It comes up somewhere where I'm either sharing that comment with someone or I'm just thinking about it. It's not possible. We forget about that at times. But it is possible to have it all. We have to plan for it and use each other's support to make it possible and plan out when the right time is to achieve those successes. Our opportunities today really result from the passion, hard work, dedication, mostly of those pioneers who came before us and many of whom thankfully are with us still today. And so while I was not born when the suffrage amendment passed, I can and I do proudly exercise my right to vote. And I've got to tell you, when I read Gabby the intro to the speech, she said, Mom, I didn't say you were ancient. I said, I know, but you make me think I do. I am. I will happily celebrate that 100th anniversary of that monumental amendment. And as our progress continues, we should reflect upon how our contribution to the next generation of women physicians may altogether eliminate the discussion of the glass ceiling. And I hope replace it with a phrase like, the sky's the limit, for all genders, across our discipline, across our specialties, really, for all professionals. And before I officially conclude, I do have to single someone out in the audience who deserves my special recognition, and that's my mom, who happens to be here today. Mom, hi. <laughs> She's gonna giggle with embarrassment, but my mom's never been able to hear me speak, ever. You want her to stand? Okay, mom, you have to stand. <laughs> We're all proud of you, thanks, mom. <laughs> That's Ruth Frankel. 
My mom has never heard me speak, so I thank Emma for letting her be a guest because she's usually with my kids when my husband and I travel, um, so I can speak out of, the con out of the state, not out of the country. But it was a pleasure to be local so she could come hear some of my thoughts. But really, although she's heard all about my struggles and knows uh, personal stories about the mentors who've really shaped my career, there's nobody who's been more of a real mentor to me and an inspiration for everything that I've achieved. So she gets all the credit, so thank you, Mom. So with that, I leave you to thank those in your life who have been inspirational. And I really, really, truly am humbled by the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. And I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. I know we are past a lot of time. I'm happy to take questions if we don't need to move on to the next session. So I'm, I'm co cognizant of our time frame. Yes, please. Fifty-seven years old. I've practiced for the last 30 years. I uprooted myself from the Philippines in 1982, brought myself to the United States, and as an ethnic minority, a small person, and a female, I went through all the obstacles that you have mentioned. And, it, and um, I just want to reassure all the medical students, the females, you're going to get there. It just takes time. We are, we are able to do it academically. There's no question. But in clinical practice, take out the emotion. Think like a man. Negotiate like a man. And know that there's a very, very slim margin between being a bitch and being assertive and aggressive. But you will get there. Believe me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have, a, I have a comment, and it may invoke uh, different opinions in different people, but um, I'm on the faculty at my medical school in the pediatric department in pediatric ED, even though I'm adult trained. And recently, the director of the emergency medicine program asked me to take an appointment with him. His reason, you do work with my students in the pediatric ED, but we can't attract good female applicants, and I think it's because our website has no women on there. So it doesn't involve any money on his part, so it's easy to do, but they're saying that they're losing out on good applicants because the women want to see other women. So you may feel one or the other ways about that, but I thought it was an interesting um, well, turn I think, of events. Well, I, I think it speaks to role modeling, which is true, that, that we hear from especially students who are across the country looking at specialties. And I would say in pediatrics that might not be as as rampant, but certainly in the specialties that are much more gender-oriented towards men, that, that women, women trainees want to see people that look like them. That's true with ethnic minorities, too. And I know when I chose my training program, one of the things that was so exciting to me was how many women general internists were on the faculty where I ended up training. And, and it was wonderful. And they really were role models for me. And I don't know that I was at, that attuned to it at the time, but it's certainly part of the, the conversation today. <laughs> 